destabilize a society, uh, both socially and politically. Now, should we be surprised that globalization has increased inequality in so many emerging economies? Well, the, uh, the answer from an e economic theory point of view is, is actually yes, uh, because the most well-documented, the most well-established theory of international trade in economics is called the theory of comparative advantage. And as I will show you, this theory makes a strong prediction that inequality should fall in uh, developing countries when globalization increases. Let, let me I explain why that's the case. Uh, I, uh, th this is a theory which, which uh, has been around for 200 years, has been enormously successful in previous globalizations, not so successful at predicting the outcome of the current globalization. Uh, now, the theory of comparative advantage says that the, the reason why countries trade is because they are different, and, and they are different in particular because they have different um, uh, compositions of inputs, different compositions of factors of production. The factor of production that I want to concentrate on today uh, is, is labor, because I'm interested in income inequality. L uh, let's, let's imagine that there are two kinds of labor. There's high-skilled labor, Pe people who have a lot of skills, and low-skill labor, people who don't have much skill. And, and what I'm uh, interested in is, is seeing what happens to uh, the gap between high-skill wages and low-skill wages as a result of globalization. So, so let's do a little thought experiment. Let's, let's imagine there are two countries. There's a rich country, a developed country, and an emerging economy. Uh, the, the thing that makes the rich country rich is the fact that it, it has a higher proportion of skilled workers. Ultimately, a country is only as rich as the abilities of, of the people in that country. So, so the rich country has a higher uh, high skill to low skill ratio than the poor country. Um, and that means that the developed, country, the, the developed country has a comparative advantage at producing goods which require a lot of skill. For example, computer software is a good which requires a lot of skill to produce. The emerging economy, according to the theory, has a comparative advantage in producing goods which don't require so much skill. So uh, often agricultural goods fall into this category, rice, for example. Now to, to see how globalization um, affects production and, and affects income inequality, let's look at uh, what happens before globalization occurs and compare that with what happens after. Now, before globalization, before trade between the, the rich and the poor country are possible, uh, is, is possible, uh, if, if people in the rich country want both software and rice, they have to produce both software and rice because there's not so much opportunity to import it from another country. Uh, and, and the same thing is true in the emerging economy. The emerging economy will have to produce both software and rice. But there's a sense in which the emerging economy producing software is inefficient. It's an inefficient use of the labor force. The labor force is better suited to producing rice because it's a low-skill uh, labor force. Uh, and, and so there's a sense in which the low-skill workers are actually hurt by the software production. They're not needed very much for software production. Uh, so to the extent that that trade is diverted away from uh, rice to software, that's going to reduce the demand for low-skill labor. So that, that there'll be a downward pressure on low-skill wages. And uh, just the opposite for high-skill workers. They, they benefit from the software production, and that raises their wage. Now, what happens when the door to trade opens between the rich country and the poor country? Well, according to the theory of comparative advantage, now the developed country can specialize 
in software and import rice from the emerging economy. And the emerging economy can specialize in rice and import software from the developed country. Now, what effect will this have um, on production? The, the emerging economy will now be producing more rice, less software than before. And th that means that the demand for low-skill work will increase because rice requires a lot of low-skill labor. That will put upward pressure on low-skill wages. Since not as much software is being produced, the demand for high-skill workers will go down. And lo and behold, inequality will decrease. What I've just given you is the standard argument that proponents of globalization make for why inequality will, will fall due to globalization. Um, but, as I said, this argument doesn't work for the current globalization. There have been many previous globalizations where it did work. It doesn't work for this one. Now, so the question is, what's different about this one? And, and that's a question that I per have pursued in collaboration with uh, the economist Michael Kramer, uh, who's a colleague of mine at Harvard. He's also at the Brookings Institution. Um, and what we emphasize is the idea that globalization actually internationalizes not just consumption, but production. So to take computers, for example, computers are typically uh, designed in one country, say the US. They might be programmed in, in some other part of the world, say Europe, uh, and assembled in some third part of the world, perhaps China, increasingly often China in these days. Uh, now, in, in this alternative model, we suppose that there are many skill levels, not just two skill, skill levels, not just high and low. Uh, actually, for my purposes this afternoon, I'll, I'll suppose that there are four skill levels. Um, and critically, you should think of production as consisting of different tasks. Um, to make matters simple, let's suppose that there are just two tasks involved in, in production. There's a managerial task, which is very sensitive to skill, and a subordinate task, which is not so sensitive to skill. So uh, w let me do the same kind of thought experiment that I did when I examined the theory of comparative advantage for this theory that Michael Kramer and I have developed. So we'll look at what happens when there are two countries, a rich country and a poor country. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll compare what happens before globalization and after globalization. So uh, the, the rich country, once again, is rich because it has workers of high skills. Uh, I, I'm, the, the, the four skill levels I will call A, B, C, and D. Uh, so the developed country has workers of skill levels A and B. The emerging economy has workers of skill level C and D. And A is bigger than B, B is bigger than C, C is bigger than D. Uh, of course, this is, this is an extreme example. I mean, in reality, any real country is going to have uh, skills of, of all levels. I, I'm going to make these extreme assumptions just because the argument is simpler then. That's what economists often do. Um, so as I said, uh, in, in this model, we, we focus on uh, how managers and subordinates are um, matched together to produce outputs. Uh, and out the, the the higher the skill levels of the managers and the subordinates, the more output you get. Um, and we suppose that the uh, economies are competitive enough so uh, that the matching pattern, uh, the, the, the way that managers and, and subordinates are paired, uh, will, um, will be efficient. That is, it, w it will end up uh, in the arrangement that actually maximizes outputs. So let's do the same, let, let's do our thought experiment. And, and first, let's look at the kind of uh, matching pattern that we get before globalization becomes possible. Now, remember, in this 
model. And this theory that I've been uh, developing with Michael Kramer, uh, globalization means internationalization of production. So before globalization, you, uh, you cannot pair a manager in one country with a subordinate in another country. That, that is, is not uh, technologically possible. Improved communication, improved uh, decreases in transport costs have made the internationalization of production possible, but there was a time when it wasn't possible. And, and so that in the rich country, we would get the workers of skill level A paired with the workers of skill level B before globalization. And in the, in the emerging economy, the C workers would be paired with the D workers before globalization. Now, what happens when the barriers to international production come down? Well, you can show that you now get this rearrangement of matching. Now the C workers, the relatively more skilled workers in the emerging economy, are paired with the B workers from the rich country. And the D workers, the, the, the unskilled workers in, in the developing country, uh, are left to their own devices. Now, what effect does this have on wages? And in particular, what effect does it have on, on inequality? Well, uh, if this is a, a, a competitive world, wor workers will be paid according to how much they produce, according to their productivity. Before globalization, which is a picture that I had on the previous slide up, up here, the D workers were paired with C workers. You probably know from your own experience that if, if you are working with someone who is more skilled with, than you, that improves your own productivity. Uh, the D workers had the benefits before globalization of being paired with the C workers. That enhanced their productivity. That enhanced their wages. After globalization, the C workers were lured away they're now working with the B workers. That's good for the C workers. That raises their wage, but it's bad for the D workers. Their, their wages either stay the same or they, or they perhaps even fall, relatively speaking. Uh, and so we have an increase in inequality in the developing country. Which it, so that's, that's the main prediction of this alternative theory. Now, what can we do about it? If you take this theory seriously, and I think there is uh, increasing evidence that it, it should be taken seriously, uh, the implication says that inequality is not going to go away by itself. You have to do something about it. Uh, uh, you have to take some policy action, which is to do something through education or job training to increase the skill levels of the D workers so that they have international opportunities as well, so, so, that, so that they are on the same footing as the C workers. Uh, but the problem is, of, of course, education and job training don't come for free. Someone has to pay for it. Producers are not going to pay for it because if they train their D workers, they're going to have to pay them more. So, so uh, at least some of that investment is immediately lost in the form of higher wages. Worse still, once they train these workers, they may end up going to work for someone else. Uh, and then the, then the investment is lost altogether. So, so the producers can't, uh, can't be expected to, to pay the full amount. And of course, the workers themselves can't do it because they're these are, we're talking about some of the poorest people in the world. So some third party has to do it. And, and that is often government, domestic government, perhaps international agencies, perhaps foreign aid. But someone has to do it. And uh, that suggests that, that if this theory is correct, the right course of action in dealing with the increased inequality uh, 
created by globalization is not to try to stop globalization. That would be a, a terrible mistake in view of the increased prosperity that globalization can bring to de developing countries uh, on average, uh, but rather to allow low-skill workers to share in the fruits of globalization by investing in their education and training. And this leads me to the panel discussion. Um, I believe that, that Brazil's education policy, uh, particularly in the, in the last 10 years, where we have seen a, uh, a significant decrease in inequality, may well have been an important ingredient in, uh, in decreasing inequality here. Uh, Brazil has made sure that there is almost universal access to primary school education. Over 95% of kids that age are going to school. Brazil has also uh, used targeted cash transfers, conditional tran uh, cash transfers to poor families for the, for the particular use in education for their children. Those two policies in particular, at least according to my reading of the evidence, may have contributed significantly to inequality uh, decreases. But I, I uh, am very interested to hear what the real experts on Brazil on the panel have to say about that. For now, let me thank you and uh, turn things back to Adam. Indeed, Eric. And now if I may invite Eric and the other panelists to come on stage for the panel discussion. Eric, it's a bit like okay. seating people at dinner party. Eric, <laughs> if you'd like to go there. Sure. Um, Sergio, oh, you're going to, I was going to put you here, if that's okay. Yeah. Just if you go there. Claudia, okay, okay. do you want to go there? Oh, I'm at, I was going to go there. If Sorry, uh, Ruben's here. No. Uh, you're here, Amanda. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. So thank you. Um. Ah. <laughs> the, the guests are shuffling themselves. Now, um, we, ha we have assembled a, a marvelously august panel to discuss this topic. And if I may, I'd just briefly like to introduce them, although I think probably most of them are known to most of you. Um, Claudio Costin is um, currently Secretary of Education for the Muni Municipality of Rio de Janeiro. She has wide international experience, including working as World Bank, Bank Manager for Latin America in the fields of public sector and poverty uh, alleviation. Sergio Verlang is Director of uh, Divitia Investimentos and an advisor to the President of FGV, and among his wide experience was working as Deputy Governor for the Brazilian Central Bank. Ruben Sisney is probably known to all of you as the Dean of the Graduate School of Economics here at FGV and Professor there. And Armando Castellar is Coordinator of Applied Economics at the Brazilian Institute of Economics. And among his previous experience was working for the Brazilian uh, National Development Bank. Now the, to the, the <sighs> The, the idea behind this panel discussion is that basically we generate a conversation between the panelists and every so often I will invite the audience to chip in by asking questions or making comments. And the topic under discussion is a very broad one, but as, as Professor Maskin said, one thing that this panel might seek to do is to drill down on that question of why the Brazilian experience of reduced, reducing income inequality is somewhat different from the global trend he's identified of w increasing income inequality. And so to start things off, I thought I might ask the question of a couple of the panelists of what do you think the key factors have been in the Brazilian experience? What has led to this reduction of income inequality? Perhaps, Sergio, we could begin with you, um, or? Well, I think that uh, Claudia, since uh, I guess is that working? Not I think you have to move not to your... Uh, okay. Is that working now? Not so much, no. but, but you were saying that Claudia should begin. I yeah, I think that Claudia should begin because I think all of us will agree that education has played a very important role, so she's in the perfect position to... Okay. 
Okay. okay. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first, thank you for the honor to be here. And just to comment uh, in your wonderful presentation uh, and in your hypothesis on why Brazil has decreased inequality, especially in the last 10 years from 2001 to 2009. There are many factors contributing there. First, it's very important to, to talk about demographic transition. Uh, yes, we have less uh, children per uh, adult in the households, and so this plays a difference. But uh, as Sergio has mentioned, uh, there are two important, education plays a major role, and it plays a major role in two ways. First, the basic years of schooling in Brazil has increased a lot. If we talk from uh, 92 to 2012, uh, the basic years of schooling of an adult has increased from 4.3 to 7.4, and in a quick uh, period, in a uh, very rapidly, it has decreased. And and this increase uh, was not only it has not only impacted the kids, but youth and adults are also studying. So if you look at the number of hours worked per uh, labor, that were part of the labor market, the members of the labor, uh, of, uh, the labor market, uh, you will see that it's being reduced because young people, uh, young adults and adults are studying, are continuing their education. And third, because the cash transfer systems in Brazil has been well designed, it started in 2001 with Bolsa Familia, it continued in Lula's government uh, with, uh, sorry, it started in 2001 with Bolsa Escola. It continued in Lula's government with Bolsa Familia. <coughs> it was well designed and it has conditionalities related to education. It is as if we are buying the kids' future. So people who are below the poverty line, families that are below the poverty line receive cash transferred as long as they keep their kids in school. So Thank this you. has made a huge contribution. Thank you. So education is perhaps the central part, but what other factors have also contributed? Rubens. Well, as a macroeconomist, uh, I'd like to remember that we had inflation in Brazil from 1947 up to 1994 which led to a average of 3.3 percent of GDP of welfare costs and which were numbers close to income transfers to the central bank and to the commercial banking system and of course that those who paid the inflation tax were exactly those at the bottom of the income distribution and for this reason uh, at, in this period, Brazil increased its inequality. As of 1994, inflation has been tamed, and uh, that has certainly been important as well to taming income inequality. Uh, I, I have two comments slash questions to, to Eric. Is this yeah. working? Is I, is I think it, everybody should working? be working. They're working? Yeah. 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 Everybody's now working. Okay. okay, so as I was saying, I, I have two uh, comments, last questions to you, Eric, mm -hmm. and uh, disagreement with my colleagues uh, in two ways. So my questions are, my comments are, uh, isn't your conclusion very much dependent on the way you assess the impact of globalization and inequality? Because like, if you say that China and India have very fast growth, and if you put everybody in the world together, the 7 billion, means that most of the very poor people in the world had a major increase in income, no? So global inequality measured this way was benefited a lot from, yeah. I mean, you can add Vietnam and you can add a number of other countries benefit a lot. So measured this way, in my view, the impact of globalization and income inequality yeah. has been tremendously positive. My other, my other comment slash question is, 
uh, I mean, I very much like your presentation, the model and, and sort of the structure that you presented, but in, in my view, it's one of the many possible ways that you can extend the comparative advantage argument. But as far as I remember that from school, uh, it, it pretty much leads to the conclusion that when you have two countries, two goods, and two inputs, so it doesn't really extend that well when you have several countries, several goods, or, or several inputs. So like when I read China's story, uh, I read, you know, you had capital accumulation in China, you know, there's complementarity between capital accumulations and skills. So you start with a country which was, uh, whatever, 85, 90% rural, 10% urban, and you start to bring people from poor rural areas uh, that nowadays, still to these days, have much lower income than in urban areas. You start to train them, uh, add capital to them, they become more productive, and, and income distribution worsens, worsens compared to when you have 95, 90% of the people in rural areas. But I mean, that's, that's, that's a, a progress, you know, it will eventually have 85% in urban areas uh, getting much more income. So it's much more about complementarity between capital and uh, uh, skills than actually uh, among. So but this is one, like, would they add up migration, for instance? So high skilled uh, labor may, uh, may migrate to the US and um, be scarce, remains, become scarcer in the uh, home country. And the so uh, do you have any sense on the relative importance of you know, your argument empirically? as compared to, for instance, the capital argument. Or, or, um, so my, my comment uh, finishing here is that, for me, the story in Latin America is a commodity story. It's a, it's a boom that led to an appreciation of the exchange rate and the demand for low skills of labor to increase way, way, way up, up faster than high skills. It's, uh, if you look at the numbers from Latin America, 14% of the decline in equality were transfers. 45% were two lower ways in equality, and uh, adult uh, education was 12%. So by far, it was labor market, and in my view, was the demand for those skills much more than the supply. So as, as Claudia mentioned, the supply of education increased a lot in the 90s. Uh, the same thing works for price stabilization. And income inequality increased in the 90s. So Actually, average schooling of the labor force increased more in the 90s than uh, in the 2000s. And the, the decline in wage inequality was the same in, the, in both decades. So, I mean, where did education or supply education, I mean, how do you explain that when education becomes more, the inequality increases? No? So we have three different directions to go in now. Um, <laughs> let, let, let me, let's break those down. Can I just come back to Eric then with yep. the question of inter-country inter versus intra-country income inequality? <sighs> yes, uh, so I, I, Armando makes the point, and, and I strongly agree, that if, if, if you look at the world as a, as a single entity, uh, not breaking it up into separate countries, there is, there is uh, no doubt that inequality has uh, fallen as a result of globalization. So both average income has gone up and income inequality has fallen. Both, both of them are, are good things. The ironic thing, though, is that at the same time we're getting a, a decrease in inequality taking the world as a whole, we're getting significant increases of inequality within countries. Uh, not, not in Brazil, uh, interestingly, but, but certainly in China, in India, and in many developed countries too, the United States, uh, most European countries, particularly Britain, uh, have seen increases in inequality. And all of these changes uh, can be tied to, to globalization. And, and uh, the difficulty with the standard theory of globalization, the theory of comparative advantage that I started with, is that it predicts exactly the opposite of what we have seen. And, and, and that, was, uh, that was the motivation behind uh, this work that I've been doing with, with Michael Kramer. So not so much a, to replace the, the theory of comparative advantage, it, it's, uh, it's been 
too successful in other realms to th simply throw out, but to complement it and, and to say what, to, to emphasize what is different about this globalization as compared with other ones. But, and if I may just follow that up. I mean, f thinking about your three reasons to worry about income inequality, which sort of in income inequality matters the most, if you like? Is, is, should one worry more about intercountry, or should one worry less about that and just think of the global level rising? Well, it, uh, to the extent that it's still domestic countries that, uh, d domestic governments that are responsible for ensuring that society is well regulated, we well ordered. Uh, I, I think it actually may, might be the third reason, uh, the, 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 the social stability. Uh, argument which is uh, which is strongest or at least which will impress governments the most <laughs> to do something about it uh, I should I should say that there, there's actually a fourth reason that I didn't mention uh, for worrying about income inequality uh, and that is that there is increasing evidence although this has not been nailed down that uh, income inequality also inhibits growth uh, it used to be thought that income inequality was a natural side effect of a, of a country growing. And, and indeed, uh, China has grown a lot and has seen a big increase in inequality. But uh, th that may be true only up to a certain point. And after a country has re reached a certain level of income, inequality may actually interfere with growth. And, and, and we're beginning to see lots of examples of that. Claudia, you want to come in? Uh, yes, I would like to just react to what Armando Castellar has spoken about education. I think you are taking a rather narrow view of uh, education because uh, the effects of education, and especially of the decrease in inequality due to education, uh, are, are very important, especially since the 2000s. It's important to inform you that Brazil has been very, very late to universalize access to basic education. In 19, just, just one figure, in 1930, uh, while Chile had 73% of the kids in school and Argentina 62%, Brazil ha had only 21.5% of the kids in school. Uh, what happened, oh, and answering Armando comments, is that uh, this decree is, can be measured by many uh, uh, re, uh, for, uh, forms. For example, the demographic transition is also related to education. The fact that the households have less children is connected to education. Jeffrey Sachs speaks a lot on that uh, in the end of poverty. The other thing is the premium for each additional year of, of uh, schooling has decreased in the country uh, since, the two, uh, since 2001. And it's not an issue only on the supply side. What I would agree with you uh, on the education is, is this de de decrease in uh, inequality sustainable from an educational point of view? No, I don't think, because schooling is not learning. Kids are in school, adults are in school, but what PISA results shows us, oh, since we are the 58th among uh, uh, 65 countries, is that our kids are not learning. Okay, it's first stage to put kids in school, but till when will we accept the idea that although we were the country that most uh, deva uh, evoluted in mass uh, since 2003 to 2012, kids are not learning. And it's urgent to change this situation. I want to let others in, but I just want to ask, is, do you see any simple solution to that problem? Of uh, let me tell simple, no. <laughs> it, it's strategic. <laughs> <laughs> strategic persistence in having clear curriculum guidelines, uh, having attractive salaries for teachers, uh, training teachers. So it's not a one silver bullet. It's a complex of 
steady work, hard work, making education more important. And expensive work. An expensive one. And uh, it won't be the producers, as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Eric Meskin mentioned, that will pay for it. It's the whole society that will need to pay. Sergio. Yeah. I, I just, I just, is that working? working? Yeah, okay. it is. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the, to the, to the panel and uh, to, to the main topic uh, of uh, discussion. And, um, you know, just to make an observation that uh, when, I, when I read the title of the presentation, I said, well, I thought this was an issue which was settled in 2000, 2002. <laughs> and uh, why? The reason is the following. By, by the end of the year 2000, by 2000, 2001, a very big database became available on income and income distribution on all on countries, and which triggered a lot of uh, studies on that. In particular, uh, there, are, there are two studies, one from the Institute of International Economics, one from the G20, which have you know, quite well argued uh, that uh, the, the income of the poor in the world has increased much more than the income of the, of the non-poor in the world. Right. And so, you know, I, true, okay, so I sort of put this aside in my head. That, that, uh, that's, that's Armand, uh, the same point that Armando was making yes, before. Yes, yes, that's, no. that's the point. I sort of put, put this in my, uh, out of my head. But, uh, uh, so it's very different. Uh, international trade, in general, not in the comparative advantage model, the simple comparative advantage model, in general, international trade improves after domestic transfers, improves welfare of everyone. But it doesn't mean, it, uh, and in particular, after transfers, and in particular, um, of the poorer stratum of the, so, of the society. So things are going uh, really according to what uh, theory predicts. However, uh, when we force more the model, we see that the old model is not appropriate for this time. And so I think it was a very interesting point. Uh, the only point I would, uh, I would not agree with you is that I don't think that trying to, uh, trying to retrain or to, to make skilled workers uh, more skilled, uh, unskilled workers more skilled is possible. In fact, uh, all the studies I know of that, and I know many of those, uh, made in Brazil, uh, uh, show that it's, uh, it's highly inefficient to retrain workers. So I think there is a very simple, there is a very odd, another very simple solution, lump sum to the, to the unskilled, to compensate them for the, for the openness. It would also work. Uh, you know, a little less uh, perhaps interesting to talk about, but the fact is it, it will also help them. That, that was just an observation. I want to respond, yes. Yeah. So I am I'm certainly in favor of giving desperately poor people the resources that they need to, to survive. So, so, so lump sum uh, transfers when necessary, I'm, uh, I'm very much uh, on board with. Uh, but I, I, but I, think it's, um, I think it's giving up too easily. To, to stop there. Uh, uh, if the, the, the um, cash transfers, the, the, the conditional cash, uh, cash transfer program that uh, Claudia was talking about before uh, uh, has, has really worked, and, 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 and she uh, suggests that it has, uh, we may not be able to do anything very much about the skills of the current generation, but we can do something about future generations. And, and, and so we should think of education as an investment in the, in the future rather than, than uh, today. Yeah, excellent point. Yeah. Ruben, do you want to say? Well, let, let me come up with an additional idea. Is it okay? okay? Where is it? Where? Oh. Let me come up with an additional idea uh, that adds to what Sergio has uh, talked. Maybe the deal workers are in such a great number that providing lump sum is going to be a difficult task as well for taxpayers. But 
what you want there is that they are not left alone, so that they continue matching either with the steel workers, which would be the better skilled workers in the emerging economies, or maybe, let's say, with the bill workers, would be the less skilled workers in the rich economy. So think about technology. Uh, I would say that one of the reasons why very poor people in Brazil or in China or elsewhere in an emerging economy is not able to somehow match with the workers in the, be in the rich economy, let's say the bill workers, is the language barrier. And uh, we all must have available uh, a technology that you have uh, instantaneous translations. And uh, once you start having that, which I think is not going to be very far in the future, you may be able to act as a government yeah. in this technology as well, yeah. because it's somehow it's going to be more uh, appropriated by the D than by the C workers, because they would be the ones who would not be able to communicate. And to make uh, one additional point that you said that international agents could be a way to somehow solve the problem, uh, that brings us the, the problem, the political economy problem of uh, a possible political myopia once you have to choose between transfer income, so simply take the re from the richer and transfer it to the poor, maybe uh, hopefully a lump sum is available in this case. There's, there are no uh, Harbinger triangle, there are no uh, disadvantage of this process. But uh, you can, uh, in this case, also remember that from the political perspective, somebody who has four or five years in term, if he wants to transfer income by transfer what he really should, which is skills at the base of the pyramid, because afterwards income inequality is simply the mirror image of input inequality, of skills inequality, of education right. inequality. Yeah. But you do not get that because that does not belong to the political cycle, which is four years. So if he's told to do it, he's going to say, I'm not going to be elected. So you mentioned the international agents. I don't know, I do not know if, if somehow uh, helps to solve the problem or if it, it even adds more difficulty to the problem, but it's certainly something that we should study. And Rubens, just to ask a question about your first point. So do you foresee a future where glo global workers are connected through instant instantaneous translation software that just allows everybody to talk to everybody? I think that uh, for sure the language barrier is an important barrier, yeah. communication, and uh, mo maybe a, a part of these D workers which are being left alone right yeah. now yeah. because you have computers being designed in the United States, being assembled in China, and being having their softwares being developed in Europe, but the Chinese who are on the bottom of the distribution are not able to communicate with the people from Microsoft or from Apple in the United States and elsewhere. So uh, that's going to help for sure, yeah. and that's just one alternative yeah that provides a decrease of the frictions. Actually, we're talking about frictions. And this decree of, decrease of frictions is relatively higher for D workers than for C workers, which is what we need in his yeah. model. Mm -hmm. let, let me just pick up uh, on, on this point about uh, language barrier. Uh, there's a, a, a very dramatic example which, which India provides. Uh, Nowadays, if you, if you um, are an American and you call your bank or you call a uh, high-tech help desk, you're not going to get someone uh, in, in the U.S. answering at the other end. You're going to get someone in India, in, in, in Delhi, answering uh, the phone. And the reason 
uh, why you get someone in Delhi answering the phone is that uh, th th those, uh, those people have basic English language skills. They may not have many other skills, but, they, th <laughs> but they're skilled in, in English, and this has brought uh, prosperity to literally millions of Indian families, uh, thanks to their employability. Uh, in uh, in call centers, so so in some cases, speaking English is is about the only skill that you need to get a uh, reasonably high-paying job and an, an international job. Okay, I'd like to open up to the audience, but just before we do, is there anybody who wants to pick up on Armando's point about the sustainability of the um, reductions in income inequality? in connections with the fact of it, whether it's tied, how strongly it is tied with the commodity boom in Latin America. I can pick on that if you want. Okay. Uh, but from another perspective, from the institutional perspective, so when economists start to talk about institutions, they have a different view from the sociologists. Uh, and if you, if you provide good enough institutions and when we had Robert Lucas here, like two months ago, uh, he said, but what, are, what is institution? So let's define institutions by property rights, but not only if your house is going to be, uh, you're going to lose your house because the train is going to pass over your house. No, let's think about the right to go and come in peace, in security. Let's think about justice. Let's think about all these types of, 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 of rights that we may have it very easily. It's not very hard to do it. Uh, and when you compare to, 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 for instance, with a fiscal reform, we should uh, have to decrease what certain groups earn right now. But very easily, I think, I'm very optimist about Brazil. Very easily, if you change the institutions and put the right institutions in place, I think that what Claudia is saying uh, would be fostered by the possibility that so many people all over Brazil would be included. And if you look at the Industrial Revolution, that's how it happened. If they change what's belonged to the average class in, India, in, in, in England, and all these people benefited from their existing rights institutions for patenting, for several other things. So I think we can improve our income inequality problem with a, in, good institutions as well. OK. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Please. There's a microphone. Oh, OK. But, sorry, there's one behind. The microphone's gone behind. But then, yes, in the front. Please. First. May I speak in Portuguese? So, perhaps you could stand up. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. May, I speak you. may I speak in Portuguese? In Portuguese? Yeah, may I speak? Yes, uh, uh, but you uh, Eric, you're not having simultaneous translation, so no. if you could speak in English, it would be better. OK. Uh, I think the main, main reason to the Brazilian uh, inequality effort was forgotten is the political uh, the political will to to do that the since 2006 Brazil made a great effort to reduce the inequality through minimum sal wage uh, political policies and through uh, bolsa família uh, minimal minimal income program and it was the main reason that Brazil uh, reduced the inequality, not, and probably education uh, of Brazil in peace and other uh, uh, programs of the, the students' results yeah. are benefits from, from the, the inequality, in, from the reduced inequality. Thank you very much indeed. Does anybody want to comment? Yes, yes uh, very quickly. Yes, I was waiting for my colleagues to speak about the increase in the minimum wage, which you are co correct, you are completely correct. 
because especially if we look to cash transfer systems, uh, the increase in the minimum wage was important not only by itself, but also because many benefits from social security are linked to the minimum wage. And when you have real uh, increases in the minimum wage, what happens is that uh, social security and uh, transfer systems related to that also increase. It's a matter of political will, I uh, agree with you. But I have to remember that it started in 2001, and it was not only one government or the other. It started in Campinas with the Bolsa Familia, a local Bolsa, inspired on an idea from Cristóvão Buarque. And so, so just to, to show that it was a state of discussion and a a kind of national uh, agreement in the country that uh, it, it was unacceptable to continue with such an inequality. We are still one of the worst countries in, in inequality, and I need to remember this. But political will played uh, an important role. On, on PISA, no, I, do, uh, I think that the fact that we are one of the worst in PISA it's a result of not prioritizing education. The fact that we were so late to universalize is not the only thing mm -hmm. that shows that we were so, uh, we, we, don't, we didn't care for education. And the evolution in mass is, yes, uh, the result of a good effort that has paid off. We, w we are a disaster in Pisa, but we are improving a lot because of good policies. Thank you. Sergio, you took the microphone. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to make a point. Yes, uh, uh, certainly there is some contribution of the increase in the minimum wage, in, you know, the real increase in minimum wage in Brazil uh, and reduction of income inequality. However, uh, all the measures I've seen, um, up, at least up to now, uh, show uh, the point that Claudia made. Um, uh, whether through supply or demand, the main uh, cause for the, the decrease of the income inequality is the decrease of remuneration according to different levels of education. I mean, whether it is for supply or demand, and this has been, this is a very, very wide from the left to the right, at least Not all of the papers I, I've met all and I've seen uh, are in this direction. There is a room and it is true about 20 to 25 percent depends how you how you measure it of the income of the decrease in, in income inequality is due also to direct cash transfers which are the bolsa familia okay but uh, so you know i i don't deny that there may be some some room for it i'm just saying i never seen uh, maybe we'll see in the future but uh, I, I still haven't seen uh, concrete evidence uh, of, uh, of a large impact perhaps some small one Eric, did you want to comment before we move to the next question? Well, I, I, in connection with um, raising the minimum wage, uh, again, th th this is uh, a policy which is currently being debated in the, in the U.S. Uh, President Obama has proposed that, uh, a $3 increase in the minimum wage. Uh, and, and I'm in favor of that, I, uh, f mainly for its uh, uh, anti-poverty and uh, income distribution effects. But it should be remembered that it is a, a temporary effect. That is, you, you are not addressing the underlying problem that people with low skills are not getting very good opportunities, uh, it, either in the U.S. or in Brazil. Uh, and if possible, I would like government to be more ambitious uh, and do something uh, about the skill level itself. That's, that's where education can help. Okay, thank you. Yes, please, sorry. No, this one first, and then, then I'll come in. Professor Maskin, uh, I did uh, find your uh, model very enlightening. Uh, but I have uh, a little problem with, with uh, your policy recommendation on who should train the workers and why I, I have this problem. 
because it conflicts with my uh, professional experience as an executive of a global company. I do believe that private companies have incentives to train the workers uh, in face of a problem that was pointed out by Dr. Claudia Costin, the quality of education. In our experience in our global company, we did, we trained uh, workers in Peru, in Brazil, in Africa, because if we did not, they simply, although they have some education, education is so poor that they didn't, we did, wasn't able to uh, perform the very simple tasks, like driving a truck, for instance, we have to train them. So I believe that's not the government or international organizations or NGO. Private sector companies do have incentives to train the workers in emerging market economies. May I respond? I certainly did not mean to suggest that companies have no incentive to, to train de workers. You, you, you spoke very eloquently to that point. They, they do. Um, but uh, I'm skeptical of the uh, idea that, that that training by itself is enough to solve the problem of, in, of inequality. Because as I was suggesting, although they do have an incentive to train D workers, they will probably not train as many D workers as it takes to uh, raise this group of unskilled workers up uh, uh, as a whole. Now, uh, and, and, that, and, and that's because uh, some of their investments is being dissipated. That they, if, if, if you invest in a worker, you have to pay that worker more. So you're immediately losing some of the investment you've, you've made. Or the, or the worker might work, go uh, to work for your competitor. Uh, one, once, he, once he or she is trained. Uh, nevertheless, I, I think that one thing that government can do uh, to, create, to cr correct the inequality problem is to work through companies. One, one, one thing that a government can do is to give a subsidy to companies, global companies, that train D workers, uh, the the subsidy could be in in the form of uh, of a tax break, for example, uh, and and that kind of policy uh, uh, really really can work in in, in my view. Uh, uh, the government policy does not have to be entirely through the educational system. It it, it can work through private enterprise as well. Okay, thank you. Please. Hi. And um, I would like to add some, some to the discussion. I think the tide in the world due to the commodity price booming helped us reduce inequality in South America because it is, is a, almost a general phenomenon in Latin America, the drop in equality. And the opposite side of this mirror is an increase in inequality in Europe and the US because of the different terms of trade. So we, ha we are in a good tide that helped us. And also, with respect to the policies implemented here in Brazil, the effect of the minimum wage is net, is, the study shows something like 20%. I think the, the, the main reason was a new dynamics in the labor market that helped reducing unemployment and increasing real income at the same time that the informality rate drop, dropped in Brazil sharply. So the education was a key factor to explain this change in the labor market. So what I, 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 I agree and disagree with what's talked is that the terms of trade shock will not be permanent. It must last longer this time than in the previous years that we had different shocks. But the question is, are we doing what is necessary to make this drop in inequality perma permanent? or once the, the, the terms of trade change, inequality will rise again here. And I think education is key, and I think if you keep improving not only the quantity of education that we already did, but to improve the quality, and I kind of disagree with you, Claudia, because I think in the PISA, 
we are still in the bottom, but we see a lot of improvement, so yeah. I think we are moving in the right direction. The question is, are we doing enough to keep the drop in equality, at least in Brazil, as low as it is now, because we are still a very unequal country. So despite all the help that the world gave us with the positive terms of trade, inequality is still very high in Brazil. And I don't think that we're using these good tides that helped us reduce inequality to make this a permanent one. Thank you. Okay. Ruben, how shockproof are you? No, you no. please oh. proceed. How do you no, want ju to just very quickly, we don't disagree. I, I said that we are at the bottom but we are the country that most evolved in mathematics uh, since 2003 to 2012. I think we are doing the right stuff. The thing is, are we doing it fast enough, consistently enough? That's what. Can we do fast? Yeah. Just a point I wanted to make, uh, which is about reversibility. Uh, if you had a, a, a very favorable scenario regarding terms of trade, or regarding uh, non-renewable resources that which are in a boom and if you use that for education it's much less reversible if you in the future have a bad government than if you use that to pay part of to buy part of your debt or something like this so this is a this is a, a, a very important thing to to, to remember because uh, we have a once for all chance right now to make things really go in the right direction. No, that, that's making the point that education really is an investment. Uh, yeah. It's not just a transfer. <laughs> yeah. Amanda. Uh, also, more or less quickly, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, I see you know, how Fernando was trying to get to the point, but it's, it goes beyond just the, the, the gain from terms of trade. You know, it goes into an appreciation of the exchange rate. Uh, a rise in the relative price of non-tradables and resource moving to non-tradables, which are low-skilled workers intensive. Uh, so what you see, you see the sectors that have grown in recent years, are construction, commerce, financial intermediation, all of them non-tradables. So uh, if you, I mean, if you believe you cannot go, go on increasing your uh, current account debts to 1.2% of GDP per year, you will believe that you're going to need a change in relative price at some time. This will reverse where resources are being allocated and will decline the demand for low skill. So it, it goes, it goes be well beyond just you, know, you, you getting this uh, uh, slump sum from trade and, and investing somewhere. Uh, and, and, and very quickly, going back to the point that uh, Claude made earlier, I mean, I, I fully agree that there has been a decline in the wage premium for education. Uh, this has been the most important thing to uh, reducing inequality. But my point is that it's not very clear if it has been the result of a, a greater supply of, of more educated workers or it has been a greater demand for low-skilled workers, okay? So the literature goes both ways. It's not conclusive on that side. But, but for me, the, the point that, you know, most education gain has happened in the 90s rather than the 2000s. Uh, in Latin America, not only Brazil. Uh, it's context for me the fact that in the 90s, way income inequality increased uh, very substantially, you know? Mm -hmm. So as, as supply and education being... Actually, the only argument that I see that is consistent with being education is one which is kind of uh, uh, strange, which is you have increased the supply of uh, college graduates, graduates in Brazil and Latin America but very low skill, very low quality graduate. It means that the return for college education has declined a lot uh, because the quality of the college graduates has also declined a lot. So it has not been that the premium to good college education has declined, but that you have now many more uh, low quality college graduates and, and uh, labor force. And just to mention that one point we have to deal with as well is the, the amount of money that you put in tertiary education, universities, federal universities, uh, and, and, and as compared to the primary and, and secondary education is in Brazil much higher than the average at OECD. So this is something we have to, to, to discuss at a certain point in time uh, because that, the, the, the high returns are in lower education. Claudia, do you want to comment on that? No, it's just that uh, it's true. We spend, if you consider just 
teaching, not uh, research. We spend more in higher education per student than in basic education. In basic education, we spend in Brazil 6.2% of the GDP. This, this, those are the latest figures for, uh, which is, uh, it's higher than the, the average of OCDE. But when you analyze where we spend in education, we are spending much more per student in higher education than in basic education. And yeah, and well, per school, it's <laughs> and preschool. Uh, and this is a mistake, Sorry. but it's not a mistake easy to, to solve. Yeah. Sorry, I, I was just making a point. It's not only primary education, but preschool. Early, you know, you know, early childhood. You know, Cubans are extremely successful in these pizzas and the basic things they have. It's not that they are richer than we are uh, or the world. It's simply that they start educating much, uh, much earlier and they have uh, you know, policies that Chile has copied from Cuba, uh, good policies. So, so you're all advocating a shift in the balance of education towards really preschool young, as young as possible? As young as possible. Are there any other points from the audience? Can I just say, I, 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 talking about early education in, in general, not just in, in Brazil, one, one of the things that's been discovered in, in recent studies is that uh, early education has a, a delayed effect. That, that is, it, it may not crop up in better school performance a few years hence. In fact, uh, typically, if you put someone in preschool, um, the, who wouldn't otherwise have been in preschool, uh, the, the, the effect of preschool on academic performance quickly decays uh, over, over the next few years. But the interesting thing is that when, when that child grows up and goes to work, it's he or she will earn significantly more than the corresponding kid who didn't go to preschool, even though the, their academic performances may not be that different. This is the Heckman work. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Eric, one of the things you wanted to get out of today's panel was a, a fuller understanding of the Brazilian situation. Do you think you've, do you feel you've achieved that? I, th I, th I think I've learned a lot from, <laughs> from, from, the, uh, from the other panelists. I, the, the, uh, the audience will have to judge for itself whether they find the discussion satisfactory, but I, I there, there, we've heard a lot of detail that, uh, for me, was extremely enlightening. So, so I wanted to move on to, to the transferability of the Brazilian experience to the global market. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you think, basically, these are lessons that are, that are just simply transferable to other markets or not? Well, just, just as I'm not an expert on Brazil, I'm not an expert on... on India or China either, but I, I, would, uh, I would guess that because uh, Brazil's success seems to be connected with some basic economic principles, that, uh, that those same economic principles ought to be applicable to, uh, to other countries, and, and, and therefore, tentatively at least, I would, I would suggest the answer is, is, is yes. We can, we can learn something from the conditional cash transfers that, that Brazil has used to good effect. And what do the other panelists think about the transferabil transferability? No, I think we have different interpretations of what is behind Brazil's success. So I, don't know, so I think right. uh, uh, what you get out of the trans transference will probably also be different, no, I think. And the data I know, uh, cash transfer were not the most important thing. As we're talking was the, the change in wage premium. So uh, transferring cash, cash transfers uh, will get you just, I don't know, 20% of what you got in Brazil. So uh, if you want 20% of it, yes, I think, I think it's easy to transfer. I see no problem with that. I mean, uh, we, Brazil is not uh, uh, 
well known for, for having a specifically, especially good uh, governance in the public sector uh, compared to other countries. So Brazil did it. If the rest of Latin America, most of Latin America did it, so uh, I, I guess it's transferable to non-Latin America. That's yeah, I, I mean, I, the transfer program is, is, is a very good example um, of something which is directly transferable. <laughs> Um, and um, is it because it, it may not uh, decrease too much income inequality, it, at least not in our case, didn't decrease too much. It was, it was a, a factor. However, it's extremely important to decrease extreme poverty, one. And two, it allows the children of those poor people not to work and to study, which makes a lot of difference. So it is actually a very interesting experience despite the fact that not necessarily will have a big impact on inequality itself. That's all the point I, I wanted to make. Uh, I want let may me. I? Uh, well, both of you, Claudia first. Uh, okay. Let me, well, okay. Uh, let me add to that, not under transferability, because uh, I'm not so knowledgeable about India or China, uh, but. Uh, Specifically on Brazil, uh, we have one. Con I have one contribution to make on the municipal situation. The, the cash transfer system in the, con uh, the country was replicated in some states and municipalities as additional cash transfer, and in the city of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, we developed something that we call Cartão da Família Carioca, the, the Carioca, which means of the inhabitant of this city, uh, our cash transfer system, which, is, which has stronger conditionalities than the Bolsa Família. So if the beneficiaries of the Bolsa Família, which is uh, from, uh, from uh, the the Ministry of Social Development that established a file, on archivo, on the, a file of, of families, the beneficiaries can receive extra money as long as kids have 90% attendance to school every two months. And, as, and if the kid uh, has good grades, this is to fight labor, uh, ch children labor, they receive a premium. With that, I'm not sure if we diminished inequality even further, but we increased the chances of success of those kids in school. And one of the, if the kid is below six years old, it's from three months old to, to six, the conditionality is connected to either going to the crash, the nursery school, or going to a Saturday program where parents are taught how to be good parents and w stimulate the brain of the kids. I'm just giving this example to show that, yes, it's important for uh, income inequality. Armando, I don't know how far it goes, but I'm sure that for education, this is very, very important to make sure that parents send their kids to school and have incentives for that. R Rubens, you had a point on that. No, okay. Just to say that you mentioned in your presentation that one of the things why we should be, one of the reasons why we should be looking at inequality is that the social tissue, the social fabric, is very sensitive to do that. Okay. So we have been repeating here that inequality has decreased in Brazil. But you do not see that as an improvement of the social fabric. Look at the streets. We had s severe problems of representation, of inclusion. And so there are several other aspects which are not being dealt Impressed. by the transfer policies, by the education policies we are doing. So this is something we have to, to, to think okay. over. 
Uh, well, uh, one, I, I didn't think that it was necessary, but uh, just to enforce I'm totally in favor of you know, conditional cash transfers, uh, especially as an as, as a opportunity to fight extreme poverty. But I, I want to throw in two, different, two other subjects we have not been discussing. I'd like to see what people have to say. Uh, one, which I think are the two next frontiers for reducing income, improving income distribution in Latin America. One is the regressive uh, tax structure. So basically, the, 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 the progressive, uh, uh, the improvement in income distribution to get out transfer, you give back by uh, charging uh, very high uh, value-added taxes and indirect taxes. Uh, the other one is the provision of public service. Uh, in, in Latin America, if you, if you uh, uh, monetize the value of public service, especially education and health, and uh, recalculate the Gini coefficient uh, with that, you get a decline of four to 10 percentage points in the Gini coefficient, so it's very substantial, no? And, and I think this is cr critically, at least in Brazil, one area in which I think much more attention is being given uh, by using uh, different quasi-market structures, provide health, for instance, in the, the hospitals, uh, att attempting public choice uh, mechanisms in, in, in education uh, so as to provide better services, uh, uh, hopefully with not much more resources. So I don't know, I would like to, to hear what you, what you have said. I mean, for me, I think these are really the actual two frontiers for, for improving. So like if you take uh, Latin America, uh, the government reduces uh, inequality by like one percentage point or two as compared to 10% in, in, in my kingdom, for instance. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's not really much improvement income distribution when you factor in transfers and taxes uh, together. Yeah? Anybody want to pick, does anybody want to pick that point up? No, ju just one quick point on what Rubens has said. Uh, I think it's not inconsistent what you mentioned with the decrease in inequality and the greater ac access to education. Because when people have more access to education, they become more, more aware of rights that are being denied to them. And, and also, they become more aware of the quality of uh, public services. So uh, social, co uh, social stability, uh, is important, it's connected with, uh, with uh, the, the diminishing of inequality. But this won't mean that the streets will be empty. On the opposite, if people get more access to education and less inequality, people will go to the streets to demand the rights they think they deserve, rightly or wrongly. But, but I mean, your point. Your point highlights the, the problems of taking something as a simple measure such as income inequality and tr talking about that in isolation. You, can, you cannot do that, of course. But you have to start somewhere and you have to talk about something. So maybe, maybe what you're introducing is a whole other panel discussion. <laughs> 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 and unfortunately, um, we are really right out of time for today's panel discussion. And everybody, um, panelists and audience, are now, of course, invited to uh, go downstairs to the new building of FGV for the inauguration of the new Nobel Museum exhibition. But for now, I'd just like you to join, to all to join me in thanking all of our panelists for a very stimulating discussion. Thank you. And, and thanks to the moderator. <laughs> <laughs>